Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. What's up, and welcome to Social Jello with Angelo. So, when I was talking to Ron Esteller about Don Zon. Don, God damn it. Didn't even get to the Just first over. fucking five Don seconds. Zonru. Don Zonru. <laughs> Don Zonru. There you go. I'll let Weston say it. This is Weston Simonis. Simonis? Yep, Simonis. Whew. Getting good at this. All right. <laughs> you can edit this out. <laughs> no, no, this is it. This is, we're in. We're, we're not live, but it's just, it's, this is as live of a feeling that people are going to get. I don't edit nothing. I regret All nothing. Right. My guests That's do fine. sometimes, but I do not. So <laughs> I, I was told that I'd probably end up getting contacted by someone who does the style of jujitsu you just mentioned. And <laughs> that's on real jujitsu. That's on real jujitsu. And someone did. Uh, how did I meet Weston? Well, the same way I meet a lot of people online on a dating site. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's actually on YouTube. He jumped in, he put a post about uh, his martial arts journey. He mentioned he's got a blue belt in BJJ. Did I get that right, Gracie? Yeah, blue belt BJJ. And uh, also um, another. What, what's the what's the ranking in Don Zanru? Did I say that right? It's the, same. Blue, it's the same. Blue belt and, and Don Zanru too. All right, so he's got a blue belt in both styles of jiu-jitsu, and he's a Kaju Kimmel black belt. So um, yeah. So and then what? Uh, for the people now, everyone who anybody who's listening who does Kaju Kimbo is now like looking. Oh, what, what, where? Oh, does Kaju Kimbo? Where are you coming from in from the Kaju Kimbo world? Like, for example, I come from the Abad tree method branch. I'm not the Abad method, but I come from people that from that branch. Where Where do you in that giant family tree? For people listening, watching first episode. Sorry. So Kaju Kimbo, Google it giant family tree names branches people fit in different places on this thing so i'm in a different couple different spots on there um i first started out in the shang fa and the gaylord method oh. um and then i eventually transferred over in with to koa in the one hop kundo okay in, with under grandmaster santos's line okay uh alda Costcos in that right. direction. Right. Um, but, you know, um, I, I've i gone through a few different varieties of different martial artists that I was training under in Kaju Kembo. Uh, my first journey started in 1995 with uh, Grandmaster Johnson here in my hometown, La Grande, Oregon. He has a school downtown that I used to train at. And uh, at that time he was Sifu. Um, and then he, you know, I, I trained there off and on for quite a while, starting out at 1995. And then I went in to Portland area and trained with um, Professor Trent Yunker for a while. Um, with him, he has this own little method he calls Realm of the Tiger Kajikimbo, but it, it also comes from that um, Gaylord Method branch. Um, from his line comes from Sid Lopez. And then now I'm with um, under um, Shan Spahan, uh, Seagung Shan Spahan, who's under Professor Richards, which is under uh, Grandmaster Santos and and the direction of De Al DeCoscos. All right. Well, um, I guess yep. on the tree, you're going to be under whoever you got your black belt from. Whoever you got your black belt from, if they're looking at the tree, that's what they're gonna. That's where they're gonna find you. Even if you cross train other people, that's how they end up finding. You. Even if you were to like move to another person, um, once whoever you got your black belt from contacts Philip Jalinas, Jalinas. Mm -hmm. Did I say that? They're right? in Canada. Sorry, that gentleman sorry, sorry in Philip. Canada. If, if I fucked up your last name, Philip, I'm sorry, bro. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I gotta say. <laughs> but if they contacted Philip, um. <laughs> Uh, that's where your name is going to fall under. Who who'd you get your black belt from? Uh, Trent Yunker. Okay. Um, and that's from Professor Trent Yunker. Did he's okay. under uh, Grandmaster Jerry Scott, which comes from 
Um, <laughs> you know, I think Grandmaster Jerry Scott was he was with the Orden as Kajukembo for a while, and then okay. and then uh, I believe he's with the KSDI. Okay, it's still that on the branch again. The po- the politics behind everything on the branch it avoids all that. If you got it from Orden, is and technically. If they look under the or I know why am I asking all these questions? <laughs> so like yeah. if someone's looking for you on the tree, they'd start looking around the ordinance branch. Not that it matters, but um it matters to some people. But that's all I gotta say. Grandmaster Grandmaster uh Jerry Scott was with uh C Joe for quite a while as I talked with him on the phone for a few times and he talked about how he was with C Joe. So it's it's really but, weird. Like I've heard a lot of people say that. And then the way they track it again on the tree, and I finally figured this out when I interviewed Philip. The way they track it on the tree is the people that trained under Sejo back in the day, like the original. There's like a, if you look at the tree in the top, there's like a square rectangular section and it's got names in there. And those are all people that trained with him in Hawaii when it was all starting. And then mm-hmm. from there, all the names branch down. So if someone did end up going to train with Sejo, their name doesn't end up up there because like it's like a sealed box that they don't open. <laughs> so it's funny, though, because like, my instructor, same thing. My instructor is instructor and both of them. There was a, a while there where Sejo was living in San Diego and, um, and they were training with Sejo. But again, on the branch, on the tree, it's not mentioned, which was like, I was like, but it, but it happened. There's documentation of it even. Um, but either way, that's hence, I'm not going to get into tree politics right now. But <laughs> I hate politics. <laughs> I hate politics too, but I digress. So <laughs> Weston, why did you start doing martial arts? What got you, what, 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 what got you started? Um, well, so my when I was younger, I was watching, you know, like Karate Kid, John Claude Van Damme, Bruce Lee, and just like, this is awesome. And then my dad was like, you need to know some self-defense. So he put me in Kaju Kimbo back in 1995. And that's when I just kind of took off and started doing all kinds of martial arts, you know, through Kaju Kimbo. And then, you know, I did some Taekwondo right after Kaju Kimbo for a little bit and some kickboxing. And then branched into doing some Brazilian jiu-jitsu later on. And then uh, and some cage fight training. Did some point karate for quite a while. Um, then, then that's when that Don Zanru came in, like back in the early, like actually about 2000, I think it was 2012 when I started Don Zanru. And so, I, I mean, I've been in, training that Don Zanru since then, some of it's by myself, some of it's with, um, a, you know, a sensei. Um, it's, it's been kind of a battle where I live about actually getting a sensei to train with, because I live kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So I'm always using my own students in my Kaji Kimbo classes as like test dummies for techniques. So it's, it's, it's frustrating at times, but at the same time, when you get to a point in martial arts in your journey, you can read a book, watch a video and go over notes and go with a sensei over these techniques and understand it a lot faster than if you were someone who just walked into martial arts and this was the first martial arts you ever did. So, I mean, a lot of people are definitely youtube warriors i'm i'm sure you've seen a lot of them haven't you youtube warriors nah what are you talking about i've never seen it i've never done anything controversial or had anybody say anything about anything i've done on youtube (laughs) well i'm not talking about talking about the martial arts on youtube i'm talking about getting on there and learning their martial arts from youtube and it's not it's not a bad thing because we got a lot of stuff but the hard, the hard part about it though is if you don't understand uh the principles behind you know the arts it's not going to do you any good to go oh this is this technique bam right 
Now, if you know how the principles of martial arts and the basics and understand those, then it's not, it's going to do you better than the person that doesn't, you know? So I have like two parts of a question here. Um, my first part of the question, going straight towards what you just talked about, uh, as far as getting techniques from YouTube and you saying that you've been doing this for a long time, you're practicing on your students. How, how do you feel about the techniques you're using now and the techniques you're using in the past? Is it just an accumulation of techniques for you? An accumulation? Um, sometimes it feels like accumulation of techniques, but I feel like it's not accumulating the techniques. It's about building that foundation with those accum accumulated um, techniques. Like when you study arts, you study, for instance, I was telling you in a comment, you know, um, like between Kaji Kembo, Danzan Ryu Jiu Jitsu and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, between those three arts, there's a lot of crossover in certain stuff. Um, for instance, like in Danzan Ryu, Kubi Chuki Shime is like this hold, and it's you're, you know, getting into this whole headlock like this, and you're escaping from it. So it's a different variation. So that'd be like something like in the grab arts which it's not like a grab art that we have, but it's a, it's a technique that you would see and then another variation and you'd be like, oh, that's, you know, so a lot of like learning the fundamentals of those accumulated, you know, techniques, I think is understanding the basics of all of that instead of accumulating a bunch of techniques that are nonsense. So understanding the, be the basics of these techniques so that way, when you accumulate more of them, like they say in jujitsu, uh, a man who wants to master jujitsu needs to know more jujitsu to do less jujitsu. Um, but th the best part I'd say about learning martial arts is finding your own journey of what makes you an artist. So, if, for instance, I want to do, it's talking about jujitsu, I want to get good at arm bars, I'm going to look at every direction that I can do juji katami, right? And uh, for those that are listening, juji katami means basically cross body arm bar in Japanese. So <clears throat> you're going to look at different directions to do juji katami, and that's how you're going to master. Juji Gatami, and you're going to take Juji Gatami and um, find better ways that are tighter and more effective than the first way you've done it. A lot of people's first way of learning Juji Gatami is probably really loose and sloppy. And some people might learn it through BJJ, where they, you know, do it from the mount position, or they might do it from the guard. Some people might learn. Juji Gatami from a throw like and dons on Ru Jiu Jitsu, and then they step into Juji Gatami and fall into place into uh, the armbar. So, you know, um, I'd say the accumulated techniques are accumulating the foundation would be better than just, you know, collectively grabbing them off of YouTube and being not with nonsense training. Yeah. And okay, now I'm trying to think. I'm going to ask you. So you said you have. Cheers, by the way. Oh, cheers. <laughs> oh, cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Water. I, I'd be drinking, but I have to teach next. Um, so, so you have ranks in BJJ and in Danzan Ru Jiu Jitsu. Um, and you already have a black belt in Kajukenbo. How is it? What's the goal? What's the mindset as you go through? Because and the reason I'll, I'll give a little personal story. So like right now, I was talking to there's another guy I cross train in BJJ, and I'm meeting and this kid is uh, coming up, 
and his goal is to get a black belt in BJJ. And I asked him the same question, like, what's, what's your goal? He's like, I, wanna, I really want to get that black belt in BJJ. And I'm like, well, what's that mean to you? He's like, I think it's, it's just a really a, a, an accomplishment. It would mean, it would make, it would be an accomplishment for me to get the black belt in BJJ. And then for me, my answer to that same question was, he's like, how about you? And I'm like, I already have a black belt. And I just, I do BJJ because I enjoy it. And that's about it. At my age, at 40, I'm no longer competing. I may compete again, but right now, injuries and stuff. I've competed in the past. But for me, the black belt at first, when I was younger, because I've been doing BJJ since I was 25. And, and you know how BJJ is. If you don't keep going to that same instructor in BJJ, they'll just start you over again wherever you go. Um, it's really hard. The BJJ community is very strict about if you came from this school, you go to this school, you got to start again as a white belt. You got to start again as a white belt. I just gave up the idea of even of that. And I've trained at different places and I've traveled, you know, Japan, traveled to China. So whenever I go somewhere, I see, you know, I just have a white belt, whatever. I've been doing, BJ, I've been doing grappling. I don't even call it BJJ for, for 15 years. Let's, let's roll. And I really don't care whatever you want me to wear, I'll wear, and I'll wear a white belt. So when I came in, I finally, when I finally settled down in Japan, I finally found a place I can access to. And I've been there for about four or five years. And uh, when I came in the first day, it's a white belt. Um, they were telling me I couldn't roll because of the rules they had. They're like, oh, you can't free roll. And I said, well, I have a fight like in a week or two. I have a fight in six, no, I had a fight. I went in there properly. I had a fight in six weeks. I'm going to have a fight in six weeks. Either I can free roll or I need to go somewhere else because I need a free roll. <laughs> That's why I'm here. I'm here to free roll. Um, I really don't care what, you know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I'll pay you the money. But right now I need, I need someone nearby who can do grappling. So uh, that's why, I, but I stuck around there and I've been there for five years now and I went through the ranks. Um, they sped me up a little bit for the white belt part because I told them that. So they gave me three stripes as I walked in so I can free roll. And I jumped to blue belt pretty quick. And then they sandbagged me a blue belt for a very long time till recently. And I could care less. <laughs> I, I could care less. In fact, when I went to that place, all I really wanted was a purple belt, which I recently got. Um, because in Japan, I don't know how it is in the, the States. In Japan, I see ads for purple belt. Like if we're look, looking for MMA coach or grappling coach uh, requirements, you know, blah, 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 must have a, da, 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 and it must have a purple belt and BJJ is on there now as a like resume thing. So I'm like, all right, cool. I should probably get a purple belt so that when I, cause I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an, I'm recently coming to terms with the idea that I'm an MMA coach. It wasn't my goal. I'm, I'm a Kaja Kembo instructor, but. Yeah, I'm, you do traditional MMA, Kaja Kembo. Yeah, that, that's, that's a totally different subject. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a podcast on that too. We'll talk about that later. But yeah, so for me, and I'm going to get to your to the question for you. For me, when I started doing that, the purple belt meant I can now have a resume that says that I have credentials to back up the skills that I have accumulated. And that's it. Mm -hmm. I'll keep training there. And the reason I'm still training there is not even for the black belt anymore. And I have this conversation a lot with my, with my homie, Mickey Lopez, because he's did BJJ also. And I'm like, you know, I, I complain to him about some of the stuff I see. And he says, and I, he's like, why do you keep going there? And I asked him, well, because when you stop training in BJJ, do you feel your skills got better or worse? Did you retain what you, your skill in BJJ, did you retain it? And he's like, no, I didn't. Like right now, right now, he, like, he, he hasn't been able to, he stopped training at the place he was training at. And he's kind of like here and there. And I said, well, that's what happens, right? Like as soon as you stop doing BJJ, it's a skill that it will just drop. Like, yeah, you'll always have the techniques. You can always roll with your students, but unless you're rolling with a high level BJJ guy, it's really hard to keep those skills or, or someone else is good at grappling. If you stop grappling, you're going to, you're going to get rusty. That's what's what happens. And that's why I keep going to this place is, Totally agree on that. Like if I stop grappling, I'm, I'm kind of at that plateau right now too. <laughs> okay, like right yeah. Now. If yeah, you said you have a blue belt. This is why I'm having this conversation with you. Like you have a, you have a blue belt BJJ, which I'd had for like 
fucking five years. <laughs> Dude, I got my blue, I got my blue belt back in 2014. It's 2020. <laughs> yeah. See, so like I said, so, <clears throat> right. So, and you've been going to the but, same place, right? Well, place? I am the place because I'm there's like I'm out in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Like BJJ is like if I want to drive two hours away, then mm-hmm. I mean two and a half hours, an hour. That's that's quite a bit out of your out of the way to just go train BJJ. I mean, so yeah, it's no. main, mainly like on when I'm not working on a day I'm not working, I'll take a day off, that, you know, like on a weekend and, and then go train you know, somewhere and, for BJJ. Yeah. Where there's people who are better than I am, so that yeah. way I can progress. But that's the only way I have right now at the moment. So yeah, I'm in the same boat. I'm, I'm an hour away. I'm an hour away from the place that I train at. So that's an hour drive that I take. It takes me, you know, whatever. I have the same issue with the traveling. So I made it a goal to go there twice a week. But the skill, like I said, on the first day, and I'm not trying to brag or anything, but as a white belt, I was already tapping black belts. That wasn't a problem for me because I'm because I was doing competitive fighting. So that's not an issue. Um, but as I progress through, I keep training because I enjoy the training. And I don't know if now that I got the purple belt from them and i put that i kept that license i never kept any of the other certs that they gave me because i could care less the purple belt is like a resume thing so now like if i have been approached by other people to coach their fighters from other schools now i can say hey because before i couldn't before i was a black belt in kaju kembo i'd say yeah, i'm an mma coach i can you know and they, they're like all right so we're gonna send to him we're gonna send you this guy for striking i'm like well you can send him over for grappling too they're like oh but you don't have a you don't have a you don't have a BJJ you don't have a certificate BJJ I'm like oh shit okay all right sounds good and then we I work striking with them and they work with whatever grappler for the grappling stuff and I kept looking at the grappling stuff and I'm like really if you can at least have me there so I can help with what's gonna happen from a striking perspective because right now your grappler is going over things that they're missing the striking perspective it's gonna get them hurt so like it became not an issue because I was able to negotiate, but now I don't have to negotiate anymore. I can finally say, hey, I have a purple and BJJ. I could do the grappling officially for you guys to recognize. It was more like a recognition thing. So I guess for the question for you, it's a really long fucking answer question. Um, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> why? Why train BJJ? No, why? Why? why why what do you think about what about you why why yeah i guess why why are you training bjj a and and then b as you progress through the ranks of bjj what are your thoughts on progressing through the ranks of bjj as a kyle jakimbo artist we always do these techniques that go to the ground right um so we're definitely, um, you know, to the ground, right? Not from the ground back up, like in BJJ. But my what ifs came all around. And this is why I trained BJJ and Don's on Ru Jiu Jitsu, because we as Kaji Kimbo artists don't really focus on any of that down there like and this is where i kind of put this in my kaji kimbo class just kind of show like the basics of the ground grappling because i feel like if you don't have ground and you get with someone who's really good i mean wrestler some half-ass wrestler that even maybe he was a state champion wrestler and he's really good at take excuse me takedowns what are you going to do about that in the street? They're going to duck your jab cross and just shoot your legs and you're on the ground and that grappling comes fast and your anxiety is going to kick in and you're not going to know what to do. So if, if I'm going to be on the ground, I want to know how to move on the ground. I want to be able to establish a fundamental of basics that are going to benefit me for street fighting and I don't want to be on the ground when I street fight, 
but I want to be on top of the game so that way I can get back up on my feet. So to the ground and back up again is what I say. So, uh, and, and instead of, uh, you know, to the ground or from the ground up, from the ground up, it's to the ground and back up. I mean, there's no better way of putting it. I mean, I mean, I, you probably agree on that because if, if, for instance, we're going to be doing cage fighting. I did some cage fighting for a while, did an MMA and some Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournaments as well. And I'm 38 years old. I've gotten injuries. And in fact, I haven't done any t- tournaments since I had my last injury I had that was pretty, pretty devastating to myself. We won't get into that. But um, the pressure testing is a lot different in BJJ. Than Kajukembo. I mean, but we also have that jujitsu in Kajukembo, and I feel like it was left to just wrist locks and standing arm bars. I mean, there's maybe a couple chokes in there too, but it to me, some of that like that standing arm bar is really easy to get out. I just turn my elbow and I'm out, right? So you got to be really tight with it or it's not going to work for one. So you, what do I, what I got to is how do I make this more effective for me? Where do I, where do I start from that? And I just fell in love with jujitsu and started doing Don's on Rue and BJJ. I mean, the two kind of crossover. I've seen some stuff in Don's on Rue that worked really great in BJJ grappling, but I've seen some stuff in Don's on Rue that's never going to work in a BJJ grappling. I mean, Wrist locks are great when you're grappling. You got to know how to use them. But from a standing perspective, it's really hard to just throw someone in some wrist lock, you know. And not to mention just, I think wrist locks have a lot to do with, it. we're making a lot of assumptions about strength. Um, I've had BJJ black belts that know how to apply a good wrist lock, try to do a wrist lock and they just weren't strong enough. Like they're like trying to tap me and I'm like, <laughs> you got me in this thing and yeah you have the technique you do have the technique i you're just my wrist to your application of the technique is just not strong enough for me to tap um mm-hmm. i'm sure maybe someone out there stronger might be able to plug but now we're talking about strength right so like that's i i feel that wrist locks are a, a weird place sometimes they work they're not a high percentage technique. If I, if I, if, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I pissed off a lot of people on that statement. In my personal opinion, wrist locks are, at least in combat sports, they're not a high percentage technique. Cause if they were, we can look, we'd see it more. That's all in combat sports. I'll just, I'll, we'll, we'll say in combat sports, and I'm talking about uh, BJJ and MMA. If wrist locks were a highly effective technique, we'd see more of them, but we don't. We see more arm bars and we see a lot of chokes. As far I've as seen like, wrist lock can come in play if you set up for the wrist lock in the yeah. right position. Um, like this the other day on that video, you were talking with that Ron Steller, right? And you were saying something about like, some people, you know, and especially in Kaji Kimbo, I get, I get arguments with people on this when they're like, oh, well, I'm like, you, you got to not do that cheap stuff and think that when you're in the most vulnerable position, that that's what's going to get you out. I go, the biting, the pinching, the scratching. Um, if you're in a position where a jujitsu grappler is going to dominate you and you're so vulnerable that you cannot do anything, your your goal would be to learn to get out of that technique. You need to learn to, okay, I'm being mounted right now and I'm like this, what should I do? Oh, I need to get my arms not there and not have him, his knees in my armpits. So he's high mounting me and punching me in the face. Okay, uh, pinching, biting and scratching is not going to work right here at all. You know, what, what can I do right there? Oh, I can get my hands on his hips and push out and try to shrimp and get on my side. And then maybe if I pinched him there, it opened up the position to get out a little better. That's where your pinching and biting is going to work. Yeah. That's where your scratching is going to work. 
When is that going to work? Is when you are not in such a vulnerable spot where you're in transition between there to make that gap. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is that wrist locks fucking suck. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They do suck. <laughs> they do suck. It, but you can't, you can't use those wrist locks. I know, which I changed it on that, but like prison no, rules. No you know, wrist lock will ever work ever. No, no. But no, all joking aside. Look. I wouldn't say that. I've <laughs> no, put people in wrist locks I'm, many times no, no, in no, different no. positions. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm being a troll. But like, uh, no, like again, I've used I've used Casey Guitar Man and, and, and yeah. put someone's arm over my knee like this, bam, wrist lock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've used wrist locks. They I've used wrist locks and they can work. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Like there's always a gray area, but I think on the internet there isn't a gray area. And then when I make these videos, if I want people to watch them, I have to put a title that's gonna get people to click on it. And unfortunately, it can't be a nice title like talking about Don's Unreal Jiu Jitsu with Western Simonis. No one's gonna click on it. Like I have to put either no. like, like the wrong the wrong still want to put what is, but what really gets people going is if I if I put, if I put a giant wrist lock suck <laughs> with Weston and Angelo, I'll have so many views, and I'll also just have people not even watch it, just angrily commenting, which gets people watching in the algorithm, which actually gets people more people to watch it to later find out that me saying yep. thirty minutes in that wrist locks don't suck. <laughs> They, they don't suck if you know how to set them up. Yeah. But here's the thing. If someone grabs you like this and, 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 and lapel grab like this, and this is very common in jujitsu because they grab you and they pull you and they want to get in. Once they grab you, their wrist is all nice and tight. It's going to be hard to really get that wrist lock. Their, their wrist needs to be soft and loose like this. So if their wrist is real tight, you're not going to get a wrist lock. It's it's not going to happen. What needs to happen is you've got to have a distraction. If it's a street fight, one, kick them in the groin, and then, then they 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 open it up, and then boom, you've got a wrist lock. Then then the wrist lock application is going to work. But if you just grab them like this, like John Heckelman was just talking about it the other day. He's like, if someone grabs you like this, I'm going to just do this wrist lock. Well, he's going to hook me in the face. I mean – yeah. Yeah. They're going to punch back. You're going to focus on that wrist lock. Well, if, if you allow them to punch you in the face while they're grabbing you, you know, it's going to happen. That's where the wrist lock is going to suck. You're not, it's not a surprise. You have to have a surprise before you set up that wrist lock and then, in a standing position. And then I mean, adding, adding to that, when someone does get you again, go right back to jujitsu right here. I'm not like the still though. I think there's some value. Like when we talk about how to begin the wrist lock, that principle is the same principle to get them to release the collar. That's the same principle. I'm just not going to end with a wrist lock, but we are still going to start with those principles of the wrist lock. Start with grabbing. You, you're not allowed to grab small joint manipulation in jujitsu. Weird. But <laughs> depending on your jujitsu style, I mean, well, in BJJ, in and practice, BJJ, no, I know. In BJJ, they, they, they frown upon when you grab a finger, I know I've gotten yelled at for so <laughs> time, but yeah, uh, again though, but the whole principle of like grabbing the outside of the thumb first, that stuff works. Like it does work to get them to break the collar. So like, to, to break that collar, that collar hold. So like, that's what I'm trying to say like that those gray areas about there's principles. And this goes back to what you were saying about the accumulation of techniques. And if you don't know what the basics are, if you don't have basics, you're, it's going to be hard to just accumulate a technique from YouTube. But if you know the principles at that point, you can kind of expand on that. But here's what I want to do. I went on a tan we went on a weird tangent there about wrist locks. And I'm going to go back to your story real quick. <laughs> so Weston, you mentioned that you started doing Kaji Kembo. You did some kickboxing. How do you end up getting into combat sports and getting into MMA? Well, I started watching ufc and kind of fell in love with one to be on you know a mma fighting so i did i did some M mma did some uh did a few amateur fights never really got anything past a few amateur fights because well training where i'm at it's kind of at the point where it's like okay where well, i've got this person i almost got him to blue belt and catch kimbo or i get them to blue belt and catch kimbo and then at that point is trying to keep their interest in being in class. So I have a good training partner to train with. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then all of a sudden they're gone. And now I'm starting with white belts all over again. 
So, um, and that point of that distance between here and Boise, uh, Idaho training BJJ, and I can go to, you know, the other direction as well, which is a bit of a drive as well. I mean, just getting good training partners is where it's been hard for me to actually want to compete anymore because punching the bag does not do as much justice as having a great sparring partner. Yeah, or even I mean, just, and, 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 and again, I think people get confused when they, when they think a great sparring partner is like someone that you get to fight all the time. It's not really that. What you're talking about is someone that can give you the right amount of resistance, even during a drill, right? Because if you're working with a white belt, yeah, you have, a, you, you pretty much, especially when you're working with white belts, especially when you're talking about grappling, you have someone there who's a body. It's better than the grappling dummies, but not much better because if anything, arguably it could be worse because sometimes at least the dummy is not going to make any sporadic movements that might injure you while, <laughs> while a white belt will. And, and if you, mm -hmm. you're a student, automatically now you can't apply full pressure. That's, that's the whole reason you want to train with people that aren't your students. Otherwise, you're not going to retain your students because your students are going to want to quit because you're going full pressure. So it's really hard. That's why it's the, my, my students ask me the same thing. Why do you still train at that other place? I'm like, because I can't do what I'm doing to them to you. If I do what I'm doing to them to you, you're not going to want to train with me anymore. And sometimes those guys don't want to train with me, but I'm paying them to. So they have to. They can't go anywhere. I get you too on that. And sometimes, like, when you're the, student is training with you you i've learned that i have to just learn to light up light up on them like um for instance one time i had a student and white belts they're very common to turn and roll when they're rolling elbow right you know like they fling their arms and their arms are always up like this and they and they're turning and their elbow goes like that and i've caught in elbows in the nose before because they, i mean they're just they don't know how to roll and i mean in street that's great but you know and i've gotten an elbow to those and then i gotta remind myself that i can't just choke this person out in like in two seconds because um well then they'll be scared and i've scared people in my class before in my past where i choked them out in a matter of seconds and they're just anxiety levels like oh, oh my gosh i just got choked out in like freaking two seconds he said fight and then boom you know and that, and that, that's great if you're doing do dojo rush but if someone signed up for your class yeah that's not that's not what they signed up for <laughs> no they they signed they signed up to learn to, to be the guy that I, do what i'm doing to them in two seconds yeah you know exactly. so i mean the mistake of trying to be able to do that to someone else you know um you can't do that with your student you have to you have to lighten up you have to be you know and that's where myself as a as an artist gets held complacency in a, in a place where I'm traveling out, out to go train but most the rest of the week I'm training with people who arms are always doing this or you know or when when they're fighting they're 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 re, they're not relaxing when they're fighting you know they're like mm, 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 like at you all the time and you're like dude you stop throwing those punches like you're trying to flex I mean, you don't need to flex your arm when you're punching. That's just slow and has no power. It's the power comes from your hip and your feet, not, not from your arm punching. Cause I can see your arm from a mile away when you do it. Yeah. And it's like, you get what I'm saying, right? No, yeah, no, no. Like I said, it's like I said earlier, there's a reason because my students would ask me and when I was competing, they'd ask me, why do I go? Why do I go to this other place on Sundays? And I said, the same reason. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to put you through what I put those other people through. And some of them arguably are at the level of my students. They've only been training for a year or two. But when I, when I was, when I was competing, I didn't know if I was going to be competing against someone, a seasoned veteran or if I was going to be competing an am, against an amateur. So I needed people of all ranges and that's why I tapped into another place. So my question for you is you got into MMA started fighting and then you mentioned an injury uh what happened well i guess we'll talk about that at work i chopped part of my finger off oh it wasn't even mma 
and um, my sheet grip's metal? gone. Sheet metal? And, and sheet metal? No. Oh, okay. Tailgate of a dump truck. It almost took both this finger too. And I'm a, I'm a music artist. So play, playing music really sucked. I mean, I play guitar. I play. That's your right, so, hand. That's your right hand? Strummer hand. Okay. But I play a little bit of the keys. It, does, it doesn't affect me on the drums, but playing the guitar when I finger pick, that finger is basically gone. Um, and then I, since it was at work, I got workman's comp to get me this nifty uh, prosthetic finger. It works for the piano, but when you go to work, it's bulky and it gets caught like right here uh. on everything. So, I mean, it's cool. Watch it bends. Robo finger, dude. That's pretty cool. But it, I just, I learned to just deal without that thing there. And I, and then I just don't even talk about it. People don't even know that I lost my finger, but I have a friend that had a similar accident, and then as a joke, he tattooed a smiley face at the end of it. <laughs> that was his thing. I got, I got a trick. I got a trick for you. Ready? <laughs> oh! Oh! <laughs> yeah. So, so you lost. So you lost I really finger. into that cross training. I'm really into cross training, and that's why I decided that you know, it's that BJJ, the Kajukenbo, the Donzon Ru. It's they all have their benefits for it. You know, like Ron Steller was talking about and uh, beach dons on Ru jiu-jitsu. First thing you're going to do is learn falls and throws and you are, um, so you got your Nage list and your wire list. And usually in the one, the school that I started out with it, you went to Shimei and Shimei is like your chokes and your, you know, arm bars and, you know, different positions like that. But, they don't really go over flowing movement like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So Brazilian Jiu Jitsu though, they don't do that many judo throws as in Don Zanru does. Don Zanru basically has the whole Nage list of Kodu Kan Judo. So they both come from the same line, but they're different aspects of the, of the art where there's a lot of Don Zanru Jiu Jitsu schools that they don't do a lot of pressure testing. They don't, they don't do much sparring at all. There are some out there that do though. Um, they do pressure testing, but it's kind of hard to, like we were saying, finger locks and aren't, aren't allowed in, um, or toe holds. You can't do any of that kind of stuff in BJJ or a judo match because they're just so easy to get. And make it, it makes it easier for you to get out of a position if you know how to do these finger locks and these toe holds and stuff like that. Um, now, applying finger locks when you're grappling is a lot different than just doing a finger lock from a standing position. Oh, I got, I got Ubi Tori right here. I don't know, or I got Moro Ubi Tori right here and I'm doing that. It's just, it's different. You know, you've got to learn to reposition your body in a grappling position to get a finger lock correctly. But, you know, it's just so easy to get them. And someone's grabbing you like this, you can just grab a hold of their pinky and, you know, you got Ubi Tori right there, right? So that's why they don't have it in there, you know, um, because it's just it's so... I, I'm gonna say I'm not gonna say it's cheesy because it's great for street fighting, great for Kajikembo, right? <clears throat> but and for Don Zanru Jiu Jitsu. But when it comes down to sport aspect, it's just it, it could end a fight. Someone's tapping out. If tapping out is the thing, then you can get tapped out in a matter of just seconds that no one's going to want want to watch. Oh, well, how did he get tapped out? Finger uh, finger hold. Yeah. <laughs> not, not to mention I mean, the drills, right? So like. To create an athlete, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about combat sports. That's the biggest difference between getting ready for a combat sport and the application of self-defense. And if you want to see a good podcast about this, uh, me and Hackleman did one on Is Kaju Kembo MMA? We did, we covered that that aspect. And his argument is it's not. It's not. Kaju Kembo, that's not MMA. 
that, that was his argument. And his argument behind the whole idea behind that was that MMA is a sport. It's a sport. It's a combat sport. MMA, kickboxing, BJJ, these are sports. So you prepare for the sport aspect. When you have the self-defense aspect, stuff like finger locks, your athlete's not going to get a lot of repetitions of anything. If they allowed that kind of a thing, your athletes, well, first of all, you're going to have a lot of injuries. That's just what's going to happen. Someone's not going to fingers. Tap. A lot of people are not going to tap. They're going to be like, I'll take a broken finger to complete this submission. And there they are. And they have a lot of people that have broken fingers. I have one right now. Um, I'm, I should be taping it, but the doctor said I could take the tape off finally. So I tape it for practice only. Um, you're not going to be able to practice. Like right now I can't throw a punch. So like, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to be getting injured. And that's why you see these rules, right? The UFC recently made a rule recently. Now it's not recent, a few years back that you can't parry with your hand, with your fingers spread open. You can no longer do this. And the eyes because of eye pokes, people kept getting poked in the eye. And it wasn't like the person, they were all the same way. And the second they came out with that rule, I started getting a bunch of warnings because that was my favorite thing to do. Not eye pokes, but parry with my hands open. It's one of my favorite things to do is just parry, 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 and then come up with a counter. And sure enough, they make that rule. And then my next fight comes up and ref keeps stopping me. No, stop, stop. So I had to just start close fisting and parrying. with not, doesn't work as well. <laughs> doesn't work as well and really consciously keeping my hands perfectly cupped to my parry really took away from the fight for me um that small little rule adjustment made a big difference right so like that's why these rules are in place so it makes sense what you're saying like yeah of course finger locks work but you can't high rep it and when you can't high rep something i can high rep an arm bar i can high rep going from side mount to full mount i can do a whole drill where the only goal for three minutes is me trying to take full mount and the person on the bottom trying to get me in close guard and I'll get a good workout. My partner will get a good workout. Nobody will get injured. And we can do that. We can keep doing positional rolling like that for 30 minutes. And that's more cardio than a, than a 5k run. Like I'll burn more calories than that. That's like a CrossFit workout right there. If I just did 30 minutes of, of positional grappling with no submissions even, but you can't do that with a, with a finger lock. You're not going to get any exercise. Oh, finger locked you. Okay, next. All right, finger locked you again. All right. So like, and that's to, to that point. Now, so you lost your finger and then you had to stop competing. What are you thinking of doing? You're 38. You know, I might go and do some more competing for a while in, in the future here. Just uh, just had to heal. Um, my hand grip's gone. Not as great, but um, I'm learning to deal with it, learning oh. to adapt. And as I'm 38, that means I can basically almost fight in the old guys club. So, yeah, I just turned 40 so I can be in the old guy club. Um, but even then I'm not sure. I'm and there's some sure. good, there's some tough guys in the old guys club. I'll tell you that. Oh, no, no, there, there is, there is I'm nothing, nothing against the old guy club. I, I'm, I'm more thinking about my, my, my instructor had this conversation with me because um, I was telling him, what's the point? Like, what was the point? <laughs> that, was my, that was my cover. I, I think he answered the phone and that, that was my opening line. What's the point? He's like, what do you mean, what's the point? I'm like, well, what's the point? Like, I, I keep training. I keep training. I don't know. COVID hit. Competition stopped. And then I got really badly injured before, before that happened. So for me, my answer was, I'm not sure if I'm going to compete again. And it's not because I don't like competing. It's that every time, like you just mentioned, when you compete, it takes away from your students. And then he told me that when he was 38, you're 38, 38, that his instructor, uh, she's Alan Abad, um, he told him to focus on his students at 38. He was your age. And he said, you know, it's not about you anymore. It's about your students. You need to focus on your students. That's what he told him. And then so he, my instructor told me at 40, which I think is funny because I got injured at 38. I took a, a, a L, LCL injury. That was supposed to be my, my comeback because I had a, a few losses and I was trying to come back at 35. Things got harder at 35. And I was trying to make a comeback. 
and I won the match. It was supposed to be an MMA match. It got it's the one that in the intro of the show you see me grappling a kid. That match right there, I won it. It turned it went from MMA, and the opponent there was no opponents in MMA, and I knew that if I didn't get in the cage soon, I was going to get uh, cage rust or ring rust as they call it. Um, so I, I got in there. I said, well, what do you got? This we have a catch wrestling match. You want to do a catch wrestling match? I'll do it. Just bring it on. At the time, I didn't know I was agreeing to a catch wrestling match. I thought I was agreeing to a no gi, a no gi match. And then later, recently, I was recommending someone else. I wanted to do no gi. And they're like, this is catch wrestling. I'm like, so? What? <laughs> I looked at the rules. Oh, it's catch wrestling. Yeah, it's catch What's wrestling. Different? Uh, it's not like uh, there's very small differences if you if you <laughs> it's a small adjustment just don't be on the bottom okay end on top that's all that's all i gotta say for catch wrestling because in brazilian jiu-jitsu you can spend time on the bottom and catch wrestling they, they look down upon that so whoever has top position is the winner so even if you had good close guard game and kept the guy in close guard and maybe even swept him up now if you swept him and got on top great but if he sweeps you again, it negates the points. And he's always getting more points for being on top. So you have to be really strong on top, on your top game. That's the only difference. But either way, I digress. So yeah, that led to me being retired at 38. And I started focusing on my students. So like, how, well, how are you, th- what are you thinking about? Uh, I think I might, that's my, my main goal is just kind of focus on my students, still uh, my students like you're talking about, and maybe get a couple more tournaments here and there, maybe do a little bit of point karate, just, just to, you know, get my students into that aspect and try to push my students into the sport part. Um, you know, um, doing some MMA, might, I might do one more in my life. I might do, I, I might just end up just stick with the bjj grappling and point karate who knows i was really thinking about trying out the um donzon ru jujitsu ohana coming up uh in july and they and the sport jujitsu for them is different i i believe ron was telling you about it where you you start out it's basically kickboxing basically and then once you grab basically punching's over Kicking and punching is over after the gra- grappling position comes in. I mean, you, I believe in the rules. Like once you do that guy grabs you, you can like punch him twice in the stomach or something like that. And that's it. Like you can't hit the face like in MMA. I don't know. Like the last MMA fight I did, I smashed someone's face in on the, in, on the ground. Can't do that in this. I mean, you, once you grab, I think one of the other positions on the ground, you have to have one knee on the ground and one knee on your opponent and you can punch your stomach, punch him in the stomach twice. Other than that, after that, you cannot punch him any more than that. You can't hit him in the face, but one knee's got to be on the ground. And so it's basically a knee on a uh, half ass knee on belly. So. Okay. It's kind of like shoot those. At that, at that point right there, I don't mean to really see utilizing the punch. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just go to the grapple, find a position to take an arm bar or a choke. And maybe a wrist lock, and 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 you got gloves on, so wrist locks probably won't even really work. Yeah, they're, it's it's rough to get a, a wrist lock with gloves. That's rough. like we were saying earlier. It's rough, it's rough to get a wrist lock in general. <laughs> I I almost finished my last MMA fight and doing the rear naked choke, but my glove, talking about gloves, got caught, and I couldn't get the whole choke because the yeah. glove was caught. And I can sit here trying to choke the guy and he's not tapping out. And my glove is stuck like this. Instead of trying to get in here and grab in here, it's stuck. And I can't get the whole choke because it's, there's just too much air. And they have, you a know, rule. there's too much they have space. A rule. They, and they have a rule where they say the guy can't grab the gloves, but it happens all the time. It's not on purpose, but like the guy's grip will get caught on the inside of the glove as they're trying, as you're trying to complete chokes and stuff in MMA. So it can get a good ref will see it and stop it. But half the time they don't see it. So you're like you're trying to complete a uh, submission and the guy's got your glove. Yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> so <laughs> I ditched whole... I ditched the rear naked choke, tried to go for the arm bar and it kind of ro- rolled it in and I just started punching in his face. And, so. and they called it. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's your best bet, right? Once well, once you have a dominant position, you start punching him in the face, the rest will break that up pretty quick. So that's that's a that's a, I mean, that's, a that's an easy road to a TKO. <laughs> yeah, it it is. It's, it's great stuff. I, I really think that 
if you were wanting to be a martial artist and serious about learning self-defense, you should at least try to get into cage fighting at least once or twice in your journey. So that way you kind of really tr pressure test who you are. I mean, it's not for everyone. And, um, but in that, in that cage fight, if you're losing, if you're winning, you, you really tested your, your martial arts, your, your own system. Every person has a system. When, once you start working on developing you, you, your first time you go into your school and you're learning the basics, and then now you're starting to get progressing towards black belt, you are already developing skills of what works for you. And what works for you is your own system. It's you, you've learned some technique from someone and it, that same technique might not work the same for you as it worked for the teacher that teaches you. And you might, he might, or she, he or she might like the technique that you are doing because they, it works for them. But maybe you are a lot smaller person or maybe you're a lot bigger person and it doesn't work the same for you. I mean, it's, it's night and day when it happens like that, you know, like trying to throw someone who is a lot taller in a hip throw is a lot more difficult than trying to throw someone who's the same size or smaller than you in a hip throw, because you have to be able to get up under that tall person and pick them up with your hips, you know, as a tall person, the hip throw can suck too because you have to really squat down to pick the person up and try to throw them so you know what is that going to work when is it going to work best for you and is it going to work on a small person a tall person or someone the same size as you so you kind of really got to know your body and how it works and the size of person in front of you because if that's where you're going to change your game and you got to have a game for each size person that you see. All right. The person that's shorter than you. All right. I got longer arms than you. Bam. I'm going to keep you at bay. The person that's longer than taller than me, he's going to try to keep me at bay. So I'm going to get in and I'm really going to use my jujitsu because his arms are longer. He's going to be able to not be able to block what I'm doing because I'm shorter than him and I'm getting in. I don't want to be out here because he's just kind of punched me in the face. Why would I want to be out here when I could be in here where you can't punch me? I mean, honestly, that's, that's your, your game. You got to learn to get in, maybe hit him real quick with some dirty boxing and play your game. So everyone has their own system. Everyone has their own style that they just don't know it yet. And I wouldn't go out promoting your own style until you kind of have a really good foundation of who you are as a fighter. Yeah, I have a hard time with that. I, I you know, hey, more power to people that have done it. Me personally, I just do Kaja Kembo and I'm happy with saying it's Kaja Kembo and not putting my name anywhere on there. Either way, we're coming close to the wrap up. Uh, is there anything you want to promote, man? Anything you, uh, YouTube channel or something that you got? Uh, on my YouTube channel is Backyard Jiu Jitsu. You can come check us out. It started with me training in the backyard and doing Kajukembo and Don Zanru and BJJ with students in my backyard. Right. And then we moved to a fitness center. But uh, um, And the channel's called Backyard Jiu-Jitsu? Yeah, and it's not spelled with an I, J I, it's J-U-T-I-S-U. Jiu-Jitsu. It's spelled the... Oh, uh, oh old, the Jiu-Jitsu part. Okay, okay. Backyard Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. J-U. Okay. All right. And I wouldn't like, as we were talking earlier, um, you're your own system, but like I saying, you, you don't want to go out and like, say you're like Bruce Lee founding of this right now. And it's a white belt. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't think I suggest that even as a black belt, but that's a different story. <laughs> I do Kaja Kimbo, but I have my own little ties and, and, and pieces of my own method of Kaja Kimbo. Yeah. That's, that's kind of where I I'm coming. I think that's different from saying like, uh, I have to get him to teach, but I'm going to try to wrap this in less than a minute. I think that's different from saying that, like, you teach, I don't know, Wap Chom Ju Jendo or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, they try to create their own name of their own system, or this is something or like, 
I think it's one thing to say you have a method for something, but it's another thing to say you have your own style, like the way Bruce Lee did it, Jeet Kune Do. And even he had, and this is why I'm trying not to go into this rabbit hole before I wrap up the show. Even he had his qualms about calling what he did a style or a name um, for the same reason. And I have my I have my own qualms about it myself, which is why I just tell people, ah, it's just, it's just Kaji Kembo and just, and just call and let them to go from there. It, Kaji Kembo. It, yeah. It's to me, it's kind of like Kempo Jiu Jitsu. It's street Jiu Jitsu. It, to me, that's what I call it. American street Jiu Jitsu. I, I think I told you about the little thing I started where I added, started adding Don Zanru and BJJ and, and a little bit of the stuff in my Kaji Kembo to kind of like give a it little, it's own little style of Kaji Kembo. And then that's you know, the thing, like that's what, that's the freedom that Kaju Kimbo practitioners are given. Like, yeah, you do what your instructor told you, you get your black belt, and then you have the freedom to do whatever it is that you want to do. Like, <laughs> well, it just depends on who you got your black belt with and your, and your, uh, who you're under. If, if the person that you're under is so hardcore about his system, only his system being yeah. his black belt, and then, it's well, different. I mean, some uh, people uh, are very cult-like so, like that. Yeah, they are. And I, I'm trying to wrap because I'm trying to wrap it up before I teach. But to that note, um, and anybody listening, maybe you'll get offended. To that note, um, after talking to Philip, who's got the whole tree, once you get that black belt, once you get that certificate, once you have that, whatever happens between everything else, um, I think the only things after talking to Glenn Fetticelli from KSCI, uh, the only other thing that can really get you legitimately in trouble or blacklisted or whatever would be to uh, commit a crime of some sort. Like if you're a criminal, if you're hurting people. And um, that, that was the, my whole, uh, I did a PSA on this a while back about uh, sexual misconduct. But the idea that if you did something criminally, like if you were, if you were a danger to your community, that is the kind of stuff that they're looking for. Not so much the the loyalty stuff. Now, I'm not saying go disrespect your instructor, or whoever gave you your black belt, but I'm saying that for those cult like people that are under that cult like personality, there are, there are no rules behind that. That's just your instructor saying what they're saying. That's between you and them. And that's how I'm gonna end the show. Thanks for checking out Social Show with Angelo. And <laughs> I'll catch you all Take next care, time. Take care, man.